Do you remember the real Ghostbusters? It was more than just a cartoon. It was a cultural phenomenon, blending humor and supernatural thrills with the familiar Ghostbusters characters. With a whopping 140 episodes, it stood as one of the era's most beloved shows. However, despite its initial success, the show experienced a sudden and dramatic decline, leaving many to wonder what led to the spectacular fall of the real Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters is an Emmy-nominated American animated television series that aired from 1986 to 1991. Based on the hit 1984 film Ghostbusters, this animated series is part of the Ghostbusters franchise and gained popularity for its distinctive blend of humor, supernatural themes, and memorable characters. Despite the widespread recognition of the Ghostbusters movie franchise, there are those today who may not be familiar with its cartoon spin-off. In 1984, everyone was buzzing with the success of the original Ghostbusters movie, which was a colossal hit that resonated with audiences worldwide. It was the second highest grossing film of 1984, trailing only Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom at the box office. As the cinematic masterpiece captured the hearts of viewers, studios found themselves in a fervor to capitalize on this box office gold by extending the Ghostbusters magic to a younger demographic. However, as history has shown with short-lived and sometimes questionable animated versions of iconic franchises like Rambo and The Karate Kid, translating films to cartoons wasn't always successful. The problem the creators of the real Ghostbusters sought to solve was how to successfully transition the beloved Ghostbusters movie into an animated series without losing the essence that made the film special. Ghostbusters executive producer Michael C. Gross recalls, We were forced to do it. We did the first movie and that was it. We had no concept of a franchise, but it became a phenomenon. Both executive producers, Joe Medjuk and Michael C. Gross, were keen on preserving the ethos of the movie, recognizing that the success of the original Ghostbusters lay in its camaraderie among the four friends. Their analysis of previous cartoon adaptations led them to a crucial insight. Other animated series failed when they deviated too far from the source material. Magic and Gross were determined not to make that mistake with the real Ghostbusters. Their solution was clear. They opted not to change a single thing from the Ghostbusters movie. The creative process behind the development of the real Ghostbusters was marked by a collaboration between Deke Entertainment and Columbia Pictures Television Production. The aim was to pitch an animated series based on Ghostbusters to ABC, and the negotiations with the broadcast company proved tense because of the network's in-house broadcast standards and practices department. As a result of the incredible financial success of the Ghostbusters film, Gross and Medjuk found themselves in a rare position of power during their negotiations with ABC and asserted their authority during their first meeting with the network. Gross recalls, They're not used to hearing that. We we didn't need them. We're Ivan Reitman. We were Ghostbusters. Basically, we didn't give an F if this show was on. Every time standards and practices told us what we couldn't do, we turned to ABC and said, F you. We don't need this show. When the contract negotiations were settled, Deke began its production in earnest. All looked promising. However, the production of the pilot faced a significant challenge in an incredibly quick turnaround. This urgency left no room for planning during the production stage. Animators had to adapt on the fly. Story boarding scenes as ideas merged, and they lacked character models to work off of. According to Gross, we didn't feel we wanted to work with the actors' agents, so we didn't use their likenesses or voices. It would have been very costly and difficult. We changed the characters, voices, and their look, but wanted to still get the point made. The creative team had to make several adjustments to tailor the series for a younger audience. This meant dropping elements such as swearing, smoking, and sexual innuendo. Monsters and phantoms encountered by the Ghostbusters were also deliberately crafted to be sillier and less intimidating, aligning with a tone suitable for a younger demographic. The casting for the real Ghostbusters brought together a talented ensemble of voice actors, 
Lorenzo Music, known for voicing Garfield at the time, the prima ballerina jetés onto the stage, was chosen to voice Peter Venkman, much to the dismay of Bill Murray, who portrayed Venkman in the movie. Murray expressed his dissatisfaction with the idea that his character would sound like the famous orange cat. Maurice LaMarche, who had previously voiced Chief Quimby in Inspector Gadget, Chief Quimby, you're no bear. That's no torchbearer took on the role of Egon Spangler. During the audition, Lamarge, despite being asked not to impersonate Harold Ramis, who played Egon in the film, did so anyway and secured the part. Arsenio Hall was chosen to voice Winston Zedmore. Interestingly, Ernie Hudson, the actor who portrayed Winston in the Ghostbusters film, auditioned to voice his own character in the series but was not selected. And Frank Welker, an accomplished voice actor known for his role as Fred Jones in Scooby-Doo. Yeah. What's an empty old suit of armor doing in the driver's seat of this pickup? Was selected to voice Ray Stance. Once the voice actors had recorded their lines, along with the necessary sound tapes, storyboards, backgrounds, and character designs, the production materials were shipped to Deke Entertainment's Japanese studio for animation. After the animation process was completed, the show received the green light, and ABC ordered the production of a batch of 13 episodes. The Real Ghostbusters made its debut on September 13th, 1986, on ABC. Somebody seen a ghost? The show followed a standard format for an animated series, with each episode lasting 25 minutes. At the same time as the first season, ABC ordered an additional 65 episodes of The Real Ghostbusters for broadcast syndication. This substantial increase in the episode order necessitated a significant scaling up of the production team to meet the demand. One notable addition to the staff was J. Michael Straczynski, who joined as the story editor. At the time, Straczynski was primarily known for his work in television, with one of his most notable credits being He-Man in the Masters of the Universe. Straczynski brought a fresh perspective to the team, expressing an interest in delving into the intricacies of the show's sci-fi universe. He aimed to explore the rules governing the universe and notably to examine the day-to-day -day functioning of a ghost-busting organization. Gross recalls, the show, at its best, was because of him. If it weren't for Joe Straczynski, there wouldn't have been a show worth putting on the air. He was head writer, and he gave his writers word that they could do what they wanted under his regime. It was a lovely working relationship on all counts. Everyone from the top down had confidence in Straczynski's ability to deliver a quality program that captured the spirit and the overall tone of the film. The goalposts were set at make every one of these episodes something that could be a good script for a Ghostbusters movie sequel. Other new writers such as the married Pamela Hickey and Dennis McCoy understood the importance of maintaining authenticity when crafting new stories. The writing team recognized that each character had a distinct way of expressing themselves, and preserving that unique voice was a focal point in their work. According to Pamela Hickey, when he wrote for someone like Venkman, for example, he had to say things in a certain way. That was the focus when we were working on it. The creative duo took a particularly insightful approach when it came to Slimer. The rule with Slimer was to imagine him as a seven-year-old boy. That was how you wrote for him. It made him their pet, and he's domesticated now like a feral cat. You had to really track those characters. That faithfulness was crucial to its success. The commitment to authenticity became a guiding principle for the writers. The goal was not just to write lines for characters, but to understand and internalize their personalities. In fact, one of the highest compliments they received received from executive producers Magic and Gross was the ability to remove all of the character names from the script and still know exactly which Ghostbuster was saying each line. That was the challenge, but that was also how much we all loved these characters. They got stuck in your head. The show's runaway success brought greater scrutiny from both watchdog groups and the network, and as a result, ABC hired a team of consultants, including child psychologists, to retool the program to make it more kid-friendly. Jenny Trius, vice president of ABC's Children Programs, stated to the Los Angeles Times in 1987, They are a product testing group, and programs are basically a product that we want the public to buy. If it works, hopefully, we'll succeed in getting good numbers. Gross and Med Magic reluctantly acquiesced rather than risk cancellation and unemployment for the show staff. The involvement of the consultancy group, Q5, marked a significant shift in the creative direction of the series, as the consultancy firm began making changes that had a substantial impact on the makeup of the show. For example, Q5 made a lot of changes to the characters. They decided to slim down Ray's character design to give him a less overweight appearance. There was even a suggestion at one point to write Ray's stance out of the show 
entirely. Slimer underwent a modification by receiving a tail instead of the formerly rounded bottom. This alteration might have been an attempt to refresh the character's visual appeal. The voice actor for Peter Venkman was changed to sound less like Garfield. Egon, Ray, excuse me, but could we move this gig along before all this chocolate makes me break out? And more like Bill Murray from the movie. What do you think's the problem? I can't bag spooks on an empty stomach. Uh, two large fries and one chocolate shake. So, Lorenzo Music was replaced by Dave Coulier from Full House. Your face is puffy, your hair is smush, you got that white crud caked on the corner of your mouth. But the most significant changes were made to the character of Janine. Q5 believed that modifying her overall design and personality would make her more appealing to young female viewers. They softened her appearance, making her more nurturing, dressing her in more dress-like outfits, and toning down what they perceived as harshness and provocativeness. These changes included altering her hairstyle from short and spiky to long and straight. The notes on the new character drawings from Deke stated, Janine is generally less harsh and slutty, has a warmer, more nurturing relationship with Slimer. Her face and expressions are prettier. These alterations reflect an attempt to reshape the characters in a way that was more closely aligned with certain ideals of attractiveness and relatability, as perceived by the consumer consulting agency. When learning of the changes made by Q5, J. Michael Straczynski stated, I think that they are evil. They wanted us to knock off all the corners. Janine was a strong, vibrant character. They wanted her to be more feminine, more maternal, more nurturing, like every other female on television. It is a truly insidious organization. A lot of their research and theories are strictly from voodoo. I think they reinforce stereotypes, sexist and racist. I think they are not helping television. They are diminishing it. This is the old Janine. And this is the new Janine. You'll note it's not just the face that's changed. Her voice has changed as well. Remember how she used to talk with that really annoying Brooklyn accent? She's now seven and a half centimeters taller. And here, the bone structure has been changed. Even the cells have been altered. Readings show traces of ectoplasmic energy, which proves my deepest fear. Which is? Whatever's changed Janine, it's not human. At the start of the series' fourth season in 1988, the opening was completely redone to center around Slimer. The cartoon was even renamed Slimer and the Real Ghostbusters, as executives had fallen in love with the cuddly cartoon version of Slimer after discovering he was the most popular character among children. The decision to center the opening around Slimer and rename the show reflected a shift in priorities. The Real Ghostbusters was no longer about staying authentic to the movies. It was now an attempt to appeal to the target audience and potentially boost viewership. The show's tone changed too, as it began to downplay its horror elements in favor of slapstick humor and reduced the amount of satire and subtle verbal wit. They also expanded the episodes from their original half-hour format to last an hour, and the overall feel of the show transformed to be more youthful. The writers of The Real Ghostbusters responded to the changes introduced by the executive team in Q5 with criticism and objection. One notable criticism involved the assignment of specific roles to each Ghostbuster, such as Peter being the mouth, Ray the hands, and Egon the brain, while Winston, the only main African American character was designated as the driver. This decision was viewed by the writers as reinforcing racial stereotypes. J. Michael Straczynski said, I saw this and a dozen other changes they were insisting upon as nothing more than blatant racism and sexism, and I adamantly refused to be any part of it. If you do this, I go, he said. They were sure I was bluffing. The show was ABC's number one rated animated series. It was an Emmy contender. It was huge, but I don't bluff. Ever. If you do this, I go, I repeated. They did it, and I went. That day, with no security, no other job offers, in live action or elsewhere. The Real Ghostbusters was popular and received critical acclaim since its premiere. The series garnered positive reviews, with the first season achieving a rating of 100% on Rotten Tomatoes. The Real Ghostbusters was widely embraced and celebrated, becoming a cultural phenomenon that resonated with both children and adults. During its peak, the series enjoyed immense popularity and was considered one of the most beloved cartoons of its time. However, after the show was retooled to focus on the popular ghost characters, 
Slimer. With a greater emphasis on the wacky adventures in Slapstick, the reaction to the new direction was almost universally negative. J. Michael Straczynski reflects, Needless to say, the newly reconsidered and retitled Slimer and the real Ghostbusters tanked on almost every level conceivable. Kids hated it, adults dismissed it, everybody saw it for what it was, a watered-down, pandering compromise. In the end, The Real Ghostbusters concluded after running for seven seasons, with a total of 140 episodes. The show's writers believed that the series had the potential to continue even further if it hadn't been for what they perceived as excessive tinkering with the original formula. As of now, The Real Ghostbusters is available for purchase on various streaming services, including Amazon Prime Video and Apple TV+. In the years that followed, writer J. Michael Straczynski went on to produce a number of shows such as Murder, She Wrote, Walker, Texas Ranger, and Babylon 5, but The Real Ghostbusters remains a career highlight. While the end of the show is not what it could have been, the experience of those 78 episodes remains one of the high points of my career. It was satisfying, it was fun, I got to write something like a dozen or more episodes without being trifled with for the most part. I loved working with Joe and Michael, and we got to tell some pretty remarkable stories in a venue that didn't generally allow those sorts of stories to get anywhere near a broadcast network. In short, it was a blast. For those of us who grew up in the 80s, The Real Ghostbusters holds a special place in our hearts. The show is often associated with Saturday morning cartoons, and discussions about it evoke a sense of nostalgia for that era of animation. The show's popularity contributed to a successful line of merchandise including action figures, toys, and other ghostbuster themed products. Data East released an arcade game based on the series in 1987, and in 1993, Activision published a Game Boy game based on the show. Despite its eventual decline in popularity, the real Ghostbusters left a lasting legacy. The Ghostbusters franchise in general has seen revivals and reboots, and the animated series continues to be remembered and referenced in popular culture. I visited a few places online to see what people had to say about the show, and found that Movie Nutball said, if you like Ghostbusters, then you'll love this. It's one of the greatest animated series of all time. And John Armstrong 1961 said, I remember my dad had this episode on VHS and would put this on for us every Halloween. Miss those days. And Steve West 1 said, What the 80s and being a kid was all about. Personally, I liked the cartoons more than the movies, because the movies had some scenes that scared me as a kid, but the cartoons were just a lot of fun. I used to watch this after school at my friend's house as I waited for my parents to get home from work. I remember always getting excited when it came on, as my friend's mom would make us cheese sandwiches. We made fun of the Deke bumper every time we saw it. Deke but I didn't know why it was funny at the time. I know the new Ghostbusters movies are polarizing, but I'm a big fan. I love whenever something that was important to me from my childhood becomes relevant again. In the ever-changing landscape of reboots and adaptations, my silent plea for the executives steering the franchise is to preserve the heart, the camaraderie, and the unadulterated fun that once captivated my generation. For in those moments of familiar faces and cheese sandwiches, I found not just entertainment, but a cherished piece of my own childhood.